<laughs> okay, I'll start in five minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, great to be here and thank you for inviting me. Uh, so it was great uh, to hear uh, this morning so many talks uh, um, about multimodal learning and self-supervised learning because uh, those are the topics of my presentation. So I will be um, presenting two different projects. Um, leveraging the synergy between the audio and the video channel for improved video understanding. So the first work uh, is the result of a joint collaboration with my Facebook AI colleagues uh, Bruno Corbar and Dutran. And this was presented at New Rips last December uh, where we introduced um, audio-video temporal synchronization as a self-supervised uh, task for uh, learning general models of audio and video understanding. And um, so we were heavily inspired by uh, previous work done by Andrew um, uh, that was presented at ICCV 2017, where um, uh, he, uh, with co-author, introduced uh, this task of audio-visual correspondence, which is illustrated here. Uh, it's, the problem is essentially taking as input a single frame and an audio clip, and uh, the network must determine whether the two signals uh, are semantically matching. For example, whether they are both about, say, violin playing. And they noted that it's possible to generate um, training data for this task completely for free without requiring any manual annotation by leveraging video. And the idea is, well, for positive pairs, for um, essentially signals that are semantically matching, you can simply sample a frame and the audio from the same video sequence uh, at the same temporal interval because they are coming from the same sequence and they are um, taken from the same temporal sequence, uh, the temporal window, they must be semantically matching. And for the negative pairs, well, you simply take uh, an image frame and an audio clip from two different sequences which are unlikely to be semantically related. And most importantly, uh, they found that um, the model that you learn produces features, both for images and audio, that are useful for a bunch of downstream tasks. So this was great work and we got inspired and we said, how about we replace this, the single frame with a video clip? But not only that, we actually considered to change slightly the formulation of the problem from semantic matching to temporal synchronization. Okay, so rather than simply saying whether the two signals are semantically matching, now we want to determine whether the input video clip and the input audio clip are temporally aligned. And so it's a binary classification problem that has two important properties. The first is that it's still a self-supervised task, meaning that we can generate an arbitrarily large number of examples for this task completely for free. The second important benefit of this task is that, well, in order for the model to do well on this task, it must uh, learn to determine whether the motion in the video and the sound in the audio are temporally aligned which means essentially that this task forces the network to learn uh, strong temporal features uh, for both modalities, um, <coughs> which we demonstrate are useful for action recognition and audio classification. So it should be clear that the complexity of this pretext task um, is controlled by your choice of negatives. For example, you can make the task a bit easier if you choose negative pairs, so out of sync pairs, by for example, sampling two different uh, sequences, right? So in that case, we may end up, say, with um, a video clip of a kid playing guitar and an audio of cheerleading. So I argue that this is an easy task because the network can see that semantics do not match. It doesn't even have to look at the temporal properties of the signal. So we call this easy negatives. But we can make the task harder by instead generating uh, negative pairs, out of sync pairs, by taking the audio and the video clip from the same sequence, just from two different uh, time windows. Now the semantics match, and the only way for the network to say that this is a hard negative is that if it can recognize that the motion of the kid playing guitar is slightly out of sync with the sound of the guitar playing. So we call this hard negatives. So we trained a model um, that is essentially a two-stream uh, network. Uh, so one stream devoted to audio, one stream devoted to video. Uh, <coughs> the audio subnet is a VGG network uh, trained on a male spectrogram. Uh, the video subnet is a MC3 uh, network, which is um, one of our uh, 3D CNNs. 
And uh, these two subnets are joined at the very end. It's a late fusion model. And the entire model is trained using contrastive laws. So uh, the, the math doesn't matter too much, but the intuition is that basically it encourages the top uh, layers um, from the audio subnet and the video subnet to be close in terms of distance if the input is a positive pair, so if the two examples are in sync, and it forces them to be uh, beyond a certain margin eta if instead uh, the, the pair is, is negative. So we first evaluated this approach on the pretext task itself, so on the problem of temporal synchronization. So we trained on kinetics, and to determine the <coughs> role of the negatives, we actually generated three different training sets. So one training set where the negatives were all of easy type, essentially audio and video taken from different sequences. Then another training set where we had a mix of easy and hard negatives. And then finally, a training set where we only had hard negatives, essentially uh, negative pairs generated by sampling from the same sequence just from two different time windows. And then to compare things on equal ground, we fixed the test set to include only easy negatives. And what you can see from these numbers, not surprisingly, is that, um, well, the model trained on easy negatives does best. I'm saying not surprising because the test set contains only easy negatives. So it makes sense that the model that does best is the one that has been trained on a training set having the same statistics as the test set. But here's a remarkable result. It turns out that if you inject some hard negatives in a second stage of learning after having first trained on only easy negatives, the model improves a lot, 9% over the one trained on easy negatives. And this is remarkable because, again, the test set includes only easy negatives. And note that we are tra still training for the same total number of epochs. It's just that for the first 50 epochs, we train on only easy negatives. So this suggests that um, injecting from the very beginning hard negatives makes the optimization too hard, but injecting them halfway actually forces the model to become more general. And most importantly, we found that this curriculum learning policy um, generalizes also to um, downstream tasks. So it benefits audio classification and also video classification. So here in the mm, green box, you see the result of taking our pre-trained audio features and simply training a linear SVM for audio classification on ES50 and DKs. And you see that the curriculum learning really helps a lot. The same uh, result uh, is uh, shown by video classification, where we take our video subnet pre-trained on temporal synchronization, and now we fine-tune it on MHMDB and UCF101, and once again, uh, using the use of hard negatives pays off. In terms of absolute numbers, um, um, this table shows that uh, audio-video temporal synchronization, AVTS, is a very um, effective way to pre-train uh, networks for action recognition. So, for example, um, our procedure produces a 20% gain on UCF 101 compared to learning from scratch. And uh, I want to point out that we are only 1.5% below the accuracy that you would get if you were to pre-train on kinetics um, using the action levels. And so this shows that self-supervised learning is almost there with fully supervised uh, pre-training procedures. Um, we also tried varying the uh, video architecture, so we tried MC2, which is a slightly less powerful version of MC3. We also tried I3D, which is a, ne a network uh, introduced by Andrew. And in all cases, we found similar patterns, where AVTS provides a significant gain over learning from scratch. In the case of I3D, we found that uh, AVTS actually produces better results than inflation, which is a common procedure uh, used um, to pre-train 3D CNNs. Essentially, it involves training the 3D CNN as a 2D CNN first on ImageNet labels, and then inflating the kernels uh, to 3D. And so this, again, shows that actually self-supervised learning does better uh, than fully supervised uh, pre-training. I want to also mention that um, um, Andrew Owens and Alyosha Efros came up concurrently with uh, the same idea of temporal synchronization. And uh, they uh, actually showed that um, the benefits of this uh, pre-training procedure extend to other tasks like sound localization on, or, or on-off-screen audio separation. 
All right, let me jump to the second project, um, which is a collaboration with the usual suspects. And uh, uh, it's about uh, finding the most relevant clips in long videos for the purpose of um, action recognition. And this is uh, going to appear as an oral at ICCV next month. So the motivation for this work uh, stems from the ob observation that most action recognition systems uh, today operate by sliding a clip classifier over all clips of the video, and then they simply average the predictions over all these clips to compute the final video level classification. So this makes sense if your video is short and trimmed to contain the action to recognize. But it doesn't make any sense for real world videos that span many minutes, possibly even hours. Just to give you an idea, uh, R2 plus 1D applied to the test set of Sports 1 million, clip by clip, densely, would take one year and a half to be uh, to complete uh, on one GPU. But besides uh, the computational cost, it's also clear that not, not all clips are equally relevant. And if you simply average the predictions over all clips, you're going to wash out the signal from the informative clips over an army of irrelevant clips. So the solution that we propose is super simple. And it basically consists in a two-stage approach, where we first apply a, a very lightweight model just to identify the clips that are more, most relevant. And then we evaluate the more expensive classifier on the few selected clips. And we show that this produces dramatic gains in speed up, but also uh, some gains in accuracy uh, because we remove from consideration uh, clips that are detrimental. So we call the lightweight model SC sampler, which stands for salient clip sampler. And we design it to be very efficient, orders of magnitude faster than the clip classifier. And uh, at the same time, obviously, we want it to be able to capture uh, saliency in clips. So we operated essentially with two different types of um, features. Audio features, which are separately encoded from the video, and then features extracted directly from the compressed video, so that we don't have to do decoding, which is quite expensive. For the audio SC sampler, essentially we use a VGG network uh, on male spectrogram, as before. The visual SC sampler instead is directly trained on compressed video. Okay, I'm going to skip the details, but there is prior work that, show, that has shown that even a CNN trained on this compressed video can actually do action recognition. So in our case, we do it for the purpose of uh, saliency uh, determination. Now, one challenge is that we don't have ground truth labels um, telling us which are the clips that are salient. So we had to come up with some proxies. <clears throat> so one uh, naive solution is to train um, SC sampler as an action classifier with respect to, say, capital C classes um, in your train set. And then at test time, you can compute a single saliency score by simply doing max pooling over the predictions over this c-dimensional vector. And the intuition is that, well, if the clip contains an action, well, one of the classes will produce uh, a strong response. If the clip is irrelevant, then probably the, all of the predictions will be fairly weak. Now, a downside of this approach is that it does not take into consideration the clip classifier that you're going to use at test time. So to address this problem, instead, we came up with a ranking loss that <coughs> optimizes the SC sampler for the specific clip classifier that you want to use at inference time. So the idea is essentially to generate pseudo uh, ground truth uh, labels, ranking essentially the clips according to the score produced by the clip classifier on the training set with respect to the, training, uh, with respect to the ground truth label. Uh, and we found, by the way, that um, both approaches kind of like work the same. The visual SC sampler works best under the action classification laws. The audio SC sampler works be be better under the ranking laws. And we, th we, we think we know why. And I'm happy to tell you why later. OK, so uh, here is a summary of um, our first results, which were carried out on mini sports, which is a subset of Sports 1 million. In this case, we use a fairly shallow creep classifier, uh, 18 layers. It's a 3D CNN. And the numbers you see here, here are video level classification accuracy achieved by uh, averaging the prediction of this clip classifier over 10 clips uh, selected according to different strategies. So these three, line, these three rows represent baselines um, corresponding to choosing 10 random clips, 10 uniformly spaced clips, or doing dense evaluation, which means using all of the clips in the, vi in the video. 
And what you see from this table, first of all, is that even the audio as a sampler produces actually an 8% boost over the uniform sampling. Um, and uh, uh, it actually does even better than dense evaluation, okay? which uses all of the clips in the video. This suggests that many of the clips in the video are actually detrimental for recognition. So if we use the visual as a sampler, we gain even more. It's 11.4. And uh, if we actually do a joint training of audiovisual, uh, the uh, gain jumps to 15%. At the same time, we are making inference 98 times faster because we are now only looking at 10 clips in the video. We also uh, scaled up to the entire full sports uh, 1 million data set. In this case, we use two deep classifiers um, which have state-of-the-art accuracy on this uh, benchmark. So CSN is the network that uh, Du presented earlier, which um, has by far the best numbers on uh, um, sports one million using dense evaluation. And even though this is already state-of-the-art, we managed to improve it by 7% just by replacing the dense evaluation with um, SC sampling and while reducing the inference cost by 15 times. We also have results on kinetics, which I'm going to skip. Um, here is just a visualization of um, top three clips selected for one particular video versus the bottom rank clips by a sampler. And what you will see in all of these videos is that while well, the top rank clips show the activity in full display, whereas uh, the bottom rank clips um, are static uh, clips or uninformative clips. All right, my take on video understanding, one minute. Uh, so, what are we lacking? So, I think one, one of the issues that I see currently with video understanding is that many of the tasks and the data sets that we have been using to assess uh, video understanding methods um, do not require really strong temporal uh, reasoning. Uh, because, for example, many of the action recognition data sets have a strong <coughs> cont contextual bias. If you can recognize the scene, often you can actually tell the action right away without having to model the uh, temporal aspect. So I think uh, we count on Andrew for delivering the 1000 class version of kinetics <laughs> <laughs> so that we can do fine-grained action uh, categorization where we will have to look at the temporal aspects of the video. Uh, also, I think that actually classic computer vision methods uh, brought in the context of video would require uh, temporal reasoning, like object detection. Um, you would greatly benefit from temporal reasoning for object detection to make your detection uh, more efficient and also uh, more robust. Uh, what are the missed opportunities? So, so far we have been using these uh, downstream tasks as proxies to learn our models. But I'm not convinced that we have the right tasks yet. And I think self-supervised learning is really an opportunity to um, search over all space of possible proxies uh, without having to actually build a data set every single time. And major challenges, well, pretty much anybody that has worked on video knows that <laughs> storage and computational cost are the <coughs> limiting factor. And uh, I think long-term modeling is mm, the new frontier uh, for me, um, because I think that we have made great progress on short-term modeling with 3D CNNs and other models, uh, but we have not uh, really address well the problem of capturing long-term dependencies in video. So I'll stop here and take a question if there is time.